I uh, am lucky enough to be the chair of the ACT, International Humanitarian Law Committee, and uh, I'm uh, very grateful to have the chance to uh, introduce our, our speakers today. And I'm going to talk for a very short period, which is hard when you see my name, because I can't say my name in less than five minutes, but <laughs> I'm sure you'll forgive me. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here, and uh, certainly to uh, Professor Maley for hosting us at the Hedley Bull Centre and the College uh, of uh, Diplomacy. Um, I think we, we are truly uh, uh, lucky tonight to have uh, the, the panel of speakers who will address certainly issues that are very pertinent uh, to international humanitarian law and, uh, and I would say, uh, international relations more generally. Uh, we're looking at a, a rapidly evolving world and certainly a, a global perspective, such things as the Arab, Sphinx, uh, the Arab Spring and the transition in Afghanistan uh, are matters of grave concern to Australia and Australians. And um, with uh, Mr uh, Yves uh, Decor, who's come all the way from Geneva, we certainly will get a chance to have a global perspective from uh, the uh, headquarters of the National Committee of the Red Cross. Um, I was lucky enough to have some association with uh, the ICRC in a number of different ways, but remember very vividly one night from the President uh, Samaruga, uh, there's a big flag with, there's a big map with flags of where the ICRC missions are all around the world. And he very, uh, very, uh, reluctantly had to pull out a flag out of, I think it might have been Somalia at the time because the security situation just didn't allow it. But when you see that, that spread of what the ICRC is doing all around the world, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's extremely impressive and, uh, and of course he travels uh, greatly in his role as the uh, Director General of uh, the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross and uh, gives us the benefit of his hindsights into uh, what's currently happening, but really uh, what, what may be uh, occurring uh, next year. And uh, that certainly uh, is, is, is very topical. Um, Mr. Decor was born in, uh, in, in Geneva, in Switzerland. Uh, he's a Swiss citizen and uh, lives in Geneva, a former journalist uh, with a uh, arts degree in political science. He has been with the ICRC since 1992. And as usual, he has an impressive uh, uh, range of uh, field uh, operations uh, working in Israel, Sudan, Yemen, the Caucasus and Georgia. He has uh, held a number of very senior positions uh, in the ICRC before uh, becoming the uh, Director General, in effect the, uh, the Chief Executive Officer and most senior operational person uh, in, in the organisation and he's been in that position since 2010. Now, as I mentioned, one of, one of the important uh, things the ICRC does is communicate really what's going on and dissemination is a, a key um, aspect of, of the work and part of the mandate. And one of the ways that uh, the messages are transmitted are through the uh, ICRC uh, review and um, the Red Cross review, uh, the International Review, and uh, we're lucky enough to have an editor from that review and the latest uh, edition of the review focuses on Afghanistan. Now, uh, Dr Helen Durham from the Australian Red Cross, where she's the head of International Law and Principles, and also a senior fellow at Melbourne Uni, will talk about the review and uh, the edition. Um, and, and also, uh, I'm happy to say that Australia is going to be on the editorial board and uh, she'll be taking on that position very shortly, if not immediately. Um, she's been uh, a legal advisor for the ICRC and uh, national manager of IHL for the Australian Red Cross. Helen has a, a doctorate in the area of international humanitarian law, is a barrister and solicitor in Victoria and uh, has got an extremely uh, impressive uh, resume in terms of being involved in both field operations and international uh, negotiations uh, around the world. And she's uh, also very well published in uh, the uh, field of international humanitarian law. A and finally, because the reviews are current edition and there are co copies up the back for people to, to take away and there's other material up the back which you're free to take, focuses on Afghanistan, 
we have one of the uh, most eminent uh, persons in the world uh, to uh, speak on uh, some of the developments in Afghanistan, and that's uh, our host here, Professor uh, William Maley. William, uh, or Bill rather, if I can uh, be so bold, uh, has been a foundation director of the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy since uh, July 2003, and he has taught for many years in many distinguished positions, uh, uh, both here in Canberra and uh, also, I find interesting enough, at the Russian Diplomatic Academy. He has a very important position in uh, educating our, our future diplomats and uh, is also a barrister uh, of the High Court and a member of the Executive Committee of the Refugee Council of Australia. He has a very uh, long and uh, impressive uh, uh, publication uh, uh, portfolio and uh, in this regard, uh, one of the seminal articles in the uh, edition of the review uh, which is just being released is on Afghanistan, written by uh, Professor Maley and he'll speak on that. But as I said, I've, I've exceeded my mandate by far too long. Without further ado, Eve, can I ask you to address the audience? Thanks very much, Rick. Good evening to all of you. Uh, can I just start with maybe two uh, personal comments? Uh, the first one is, is about whether I'm listening, listening to you, Rick, talking about where I was born, I realized it would have been good to be born in Obart, or, you know, because <laughs> born in Zurich, Switzerland is not that good. I just, I just, uh, my, my first experience in Australia right now, and I really had joy to start with Obart. There was the national conference of the uh, Australian Red Cross there, and I was very happy to start with uh, Tasmania. It's a good start, no? And then to arrive in Canberra. So I'm very pleased to be with you, and my second personal comment is about the review. And that, don't quote me, but it's a personal experience. I've read the review for a long time, and sometimes I loved it, but sometimes I found it very boring too. Uh, I mean, and I'm really a reader, a serious reader about it. This review, this edition, is certainly one of the best I've seen over time, and I'm serious about that. And I think it also shows, and Ellen will talk about that, it shows exactly what this review is trying to achieve, which is to put on the table, at a key moment, I do think, different perspective about Afghanistan, because you can have different perspective about Afghanistan in order to really forge informed opinion. I do think that Afghanistan will continue to be really central, including after 2014, uh, will be central to all of us, not only in terms of humanitarian needs, and I'll come back to that, but also in terms of policies, in terms of commitment long term. And I think it's absolutely strategic to have a well-informed and understanding of what's happening there. And I, in that sense, I, I do think I'm very happy to be part of this panel because it's an important moment to be, to be launched at and I hope you will have the chance to explore uh, and also to discuss some of the, of the questions. I've been asked briefly to, um, and that's what I would like to do with you, is Afghanistan is an important one, it's an important feature, but maybe before digging in and exploring Afghanistan, maybe just to look at two or three other I would say trends which will affect uh, armed conflict in 2012. I'll be rather uh, short and then select some of them and I'll come back to Afghanistan and then let uh, uh, Professor Meli to really explore it uh, with much more uh, uh, savviness or, uh, and, and wisdom than, than I can do. Uh, the first element you need to know about ICSC, I think you know that, we are uh, extremely armed, conflict-oriented, so we are 82 country and we are really connected uh, there, and normally we are in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the places for, for a decade, right? We stay there for a decade. Afghanistan is more than now 35 years of commitment of the ICSC. Uh, it's the same in Palestine, same in Sudan, same in Yemen. So our perspective, and it's only one perspective, you can have different are really based on, first and foremost, the needs of the people, the humanitarian needs of the people. And we're trying to understand the evolution of their needs because it tells us a lot about what we understand, what we can say about the world of, of tomorrow. And let's be also honest, sometimes we get it wrong. I would have been with you a year ago, I wouldn't have spoken about Libya, for example. I would certainly spoke about Syria, about Palestine, maybe not the same dynamic, but for them Libya was something we didn't understand a year ago. So just also to be humble, we don't, don't, we don't, don't always get it, but I think there is an interesting dynamic and that's what I would like to share with you based on your mental needs. And maybe the first things I would like to mention before going on to two or three very important region or country, two or three dynamic which will affect all the conflict around the world. The first one is not a surprise for you, is the economic crisis. 
I really would like all of you not to under underestimate, uh, let's say, the impact of the economic crisis. We're all aware, we look at the stock market, we are looking at uh, unemployment, and rightly so, we are looking more than ever at Brussels. I think we will still have some surprise. Every week there is a new summit. Uh, every week we expect something new happening, uh, and it will continue to do so. But what is amazing also is to look maybe, maybe some behind some of the questions, and one, one element which has really struck us is the price of the food, basic food. Cereal, for example. Since 2007, the price of the cereal have more than doubled. And what is interesting, it doubled, in fact, in 2007, 2008. That was the moment where it doubled. But normally what happens is then it goes down after a while. And this time what is interesting is that the norm is that it has maintained a very, very high level. The peak was first quarter of 2011. And since then it has gone down a little bit, but still very, very high. And what is interesting when you start now, of course, to try to learn what happened in Egypt and Tunisia, to start with, uh, is A, there is different factors. We know that. There is a factor about pop young population, educated, no options, no solutions, at the same time, easy access to internet and new technologies, corruption of the regime, I mean, plenty of things. But one of the factors we should not underestimate, absolutely, is the price of the food in the market. Absolutely, clear. has an enormous impact. It's not the only reason, but it's absolutely a key reason which can explain social unrest, civil unrest. And if we agree with that, we can already need, know, know that in 2012, there will be a lot of pressure on the people, basically, with the f price of food very high. Very, very high, right? Very high. And it doesn't go down. And that's clearly one element which will impact enormously on conflict. That's one. Let me just go now to another trend. And again, sorry, it's never really new, but what is interesting is the dynamic and the speed which, which it, it happens. Is New technologies, uh, of course, are proposing new solutions, and we see that, including in the humanitarian world, it's also changing the way we operate. For example, we see in our domain uh, an extremely rapidly uh, changing uh, dynamic around needs assessment, for example. The way we were assessing needs a few years ago, we took time, it took time to do that. I can tell you things are changing quickly for two reasons. One, because people are affecting, assessing their needs themselves. They're able to communicate that, communicate that much more easily on maps. Maps are much more important now in terms of decision-making for the one who are following up, who you know, so the Ushaidi and other places. So it's interesting to look at truly new technology influencing decision-making in the humanitarian sectors. But I would like also to say one big trend we've seen now over years, but which will be just reinforced in 2012, talking about international humanitarian law also, is the fact that new technologies are also affecting the way war and armed conflict are fought, right, more and more. And what we see is remote control weapons, much more, it was already the case, but we'll see just more of them, especially the drone, we know, big success, right? Next year, plus 30% of drone. The spending is certainly one of the pen weapon going on. It's eight billion next year of dollar on the drone. And, and we see that in Yemen, in Afghanistan, but Yemen, Pakistan, Sahel. And of course, what, what I mean by remote control, it gives you a bit of an impression of what it is. You, it's re remote control. And of course, it has impact on the people in the way war are fought. And I can just add on in 2012 a, a trend we've seen also coming up. It's all the cyber dimension, right? And uh, cyber war or cyber attack. We can talk about that. Some people think it's a bit, you know, uh, science fiction. It, there's a tendency now these days to talk about cyber security. I know that. I just would like to talk about cyber war also. Of course, there are cyber war. There are states which are preparing themselves. We've seen that. We've seen, for example, the United States of America, the way they organize their army. You know that there are five commands, which are really the central command, south command, north command. They just recently had a sixth command, which is called cyber command. It's not by surprise. You know, the United States of America, again, recently, they just told the world, in a way, that they would consider a cyber attack at a certain level as an act of war and then there will be the response needed. So we are in a moment, and it's not a surprise, where we will see more of that. And clearly the crisis with Iran, for example, has already shown that, will show that again in 2012. And I think for us, 
and for the people affected and for the needs, of course, it's an issue because it's an issue about proportionality. It's an issue about distinction. How do you distinguish distinguish a military target, which is legitimate, versus a civilian target? So, typically, 2012, we will see more this type of questions, more this type of challenge for the people, but also for United Organization. So, just to look at two issues which will see that. Let me just add a third one, global issue, uh, which is not a new one, but it's an issue that we, we at the ICRC, we at the Red Cross, Red Crescent, we want to put on the table is the fact that we think that medical mission, hospital, medical personnel, patients are less and less respected around the world. And this is not something really new, but what is maybe new is the fact that we see clearly government, but also armed groups, using in fact, medical facilities, ambulances, hospital, as, uh, t let's say, targeting them in order to really put uh, people under, under pressure. And that's a major issue, I think, for all of us, because we do believe that if healthcare cannot be provided, including in the toughest time, in war and armed conflict, that will be something problematic. And we see that across the world. Look at Middle East. If you look at all the issues around Middle East, you will see a lot of hospital, a lot of pressure on medical, on doctors. But you see that also at the time in, in Asia, in Africa. And I think it's a big, big issue. We brought that at the International Conference of the Red Cross Red Crescent last week, which brings together states and all the national Red Cross and Red Crescent. And this is really an issue where we want to push. This is an important one. I strongly <coughs> believe that if we are not able, we, and we, it's not only the Red Cross, not only ICRC, not only the states, but also we here in this room, uh, we are not able to push these issues to make you know, hospitals being respected. Doctors, nurses, ambulances being respected, we will go into a very serious problem. This, this is really the basic, the basic element of humanity. We need to be very careful. So, three trends. Now let me just focus on two regions in order not to be too long. The first one you mentioned, Rick, is the famous Arab Spring. Can I just say, I said that already, some of you are not at ease with the notion of Arab Spring for two reasons. One, because of spring, not always sure winter, well, no, when, when the winter comes, you know, uh, summer, fall, winter. I'm not sure exactly where we are in Egypt right now or, or, or where we are in Syria, but that's another story. But I think the notion of Arabs is maybe the more problematic. I think it gives us this impression that the Arab Spring will remain, contain, if you want, only in Middle East, in the Arab world. I think this is misleading, right? It's true in 2011, 2012, possibly still the key places will be in the Arab world, it's very true. But we have to think a bit largely, maybe also because we didn't really see it coming up, but clearly if you look at around, around the Middle East, I think there is a very clear sub-Saharan country which will be affected, which are already affected, and not only by uh, uh, uniquely access to internet and uh, food prices, but also the availability of weapons. If you just look at Libya as an example, Libya will have as an impact on the region, there is no doubt. You can see there are more weapons now arriving in Mali, for example, more weapons arriving in Darfur, and it will have an impact. There is no doubt on that one, just mentioning that. We need to look at also some of the factors, and clearly Central Asia, as an example, would be a place where I would also carefully look at. Doesn't mean it will happen, but I think we need to think about this dynamic as something more global and more general. And I would say think that um, we can maybe not only look at Middle East and or difficult region, maybe we also need to look at Europe. I'm not sure Europe will have the same type of violence, but I think we need to grasp what happened in London, what happened in Athens, uh, what happened when a, an entire population feel totally um, disconnected and there is no solutions proposed. I think it might be problematic and we might find ourselves in a situation a bit more complex than we think uh, over time. Now, I would like, so when we talk about the Arab Spring, I think the first element, let things a little bit more openly than just in the Middle East. Now, nevertheless, in 2012, the place to watch, of course, is Syria, very clearly. Uh, is, is, I think we can also watch Egypt and Tunisia, but in terms of humanitarian needs, in terms of dynamic, I think Syria is going through, we all agree with that, through a very difficult time. It's a very difficult time for Syria and also. And I think here the question for us, uh, the International Community of the Red Cross, we are working in Syria, we are trying to do our best, but our response is limited uh, because of the situation and because it's, it's complicated right now to be able to work where we would like to work. Uh, but I think what we see is um, we see some part of the country 
clearly in a situation where we might not exclude anymore, we might not exclude anymore a civil war in some part of the country. I will be careful not to talk about the entire Syria, but there are some part of the country which are under enormous pressure, and I think we might not exclude that. And here, here when we talk about civil war, the issue is, is the how. We don't have a predictions about where it, when does it end. I think nobody knows, frankly, nobody knows how and what's the dynamic in 2012. It might be long, it might be very difficult for, uh, for people in Syria, but I think what is important is the how. And the how might have an impact then clearly inter interreligious, interethnic problems, and here immediately would have an impact, a spillover on Lebanon, for example. Huh? To Lebanon, clearly, when you have also a very, very complex dynamic, and if, of course, if, if, uh, if Syria goes in that direction, it might be very difficult for, for Lebanon. So 2012, very clearly, Syria will be at the centers of our preoccupation. You can add Yemen as a, as a very difficult country also, difficult for the people. Uh, Yemen is a very complicated country now. It's almost divided in three. The, the north, the centers, and the south, they have different dynamics and also ed enormous humanitarian problems. We just had recent year, yesterday very heavy fighting in Taiz, for example, very difficult for us and for our colleagues of the Yemeni Red Crescent to do just basic work, checkpoint, bringing wounded where they, they, they need to go. And on the south, um, we recently had two people taken hostage three weeks ago. We were able to take them out. But it shows the, the difficulties, and just about ICSC, but if you just talk about the people, I think we, we, we know how difficult it is. Maybe my last word on Arab Spring is we should be careful uh, to understand the trend, but then the response and the understanding should be context by context. Because you cannot compare Egypt with Tunisia. You should really not compare Tunisia with Yemen and not Yemen with, uh, uh, with Libya, for example. And I think we need to be very careful to look into that. And I think that, that's one element to, to look into that. Briefly, second uh, region uh, which we think are of, of enormous importance, and I mentioned that, I could mention other places, but one place is which we are extremely worried uh, is, is Somalia, in terms of, again, if we base that on, on, on United needs. We are worried, why? Because Somalia is again under pressure. I mean, it's not new, Somalia over the last almost 20 years, without exception, has been a concern for all of us. By the way, the question I'm asking myself is how are they able to cope? Because every year we are saying, my team are saying, it's the worst year ever, and then it goes down and down. Now there's a moment where are just wondering. We think their coping mechanism is really at the limit of, of what is possible, but okay. But I think what is important for us is we have a drought there, we have an armed conflict for quite a long time, we have a very difficult situation, but I would like just to add for your attention to when you think about 2012, what is new is we have the intervention of a country, Kenya, another one, Ethiopia, by the way, but especially Kenya, who comes in, right? With my, my concern is comes in with a very strong conviction <coughs> when you discuss with Kenyan leadership, but only with, not only with Kenyan leadership, with a strong conviction that they will win it, no problem, police operation will go in a few months, it will be done. I mean, Sorry, we have a very, I mean, we, we've been there for a long time and every time we've seen an intervention of a state, it has been extremely difficult for the Somali people, of course, but also very difficult for the country <coughs> and for the citizens of the country and then for the political dimension. So imagine Kenya is now fully engaged in Somalia, it will be found difficult then to withdraw, they go on for that, and it's at the very same time a year where <coughs> Kenya is going through elections. And for the one, remember what happened in the elections 2007, 2008 in Kenya. So you will have a country which is a very pivotal country. If you look at Africa, Kenya is a very important country for, for different reasons. Uh, you might have a country which will be uh, under a difficult sit situation. So I watch, want to watch very carefully. And maybe let me just finish in terms of key region. If we talk about 2012, uh, we looked at Arab Spring, right away. We look at uh, Somalia uh, and Kenya. The third element is, of course, Afghanistan. And not only Afghanistan because it's in the review, but we even without the review, I would spoke about Afghanistan, right? And I'm again sad to present Afghanistan because you could say, do you have anything new? No, for an organization like us working in armed conflict, uh, Afghanistan remain uh, a very, very important operation for us. Uh, but for one good reason is because we think in 2012, the situation will not only not improve, but will deteriorate. Right? And I think there are certain numbers of reasons why. The first reason is, uh, right now already, uh, you have a lot of insecurity in the country. There is more 
war or let's say more fighting in the country than there was uh, a few years ago. Uh, and I think the big issue is about today, it's about the transition and what I would call the end over. I think there's absolutely no discussion in terms of policy, that it's normal to have an end over and transition. But if I just look at the different perspective, a humanitarian perspective, the issue is the following <coughs> one. When you announce a transition and an end over, after 10 years of war, of course, uh, you have, a, let's say, a moment where all the actors are trying to find themselves a new position in the conflict. It's exactly what we're going through right now in Afghanistan. Right? Of course, everybody knows that the international community is leaving, first as international forces, but the impression of Afghan is the international community is leaving, right? that the commitment won't be there, and what is happening, you have a lot of forces right now in Afghanistan repositioning themselves to be able to, if not control the power, at least to play a bigger role. And I think we should be very careful not to have a very classical vision, okay, now it's simple, the Taliban were out, now the Taliban are back. First the Taliban, and I think we'll discuss that, it's a much more complex organization than just one little thing like that. Uh, we know a lot of blurring of the line in, in Afghanistan between armed opposition, some of the armed opposition, and a criminal. So I think there will be an enormous impact on people. It's already the case, but we expect 2012 to be a very difficult year. And it will be difficult also because in this country, in Australia, like a lot of other countries, you will always constantly hear different reading about Afghanistan. You'll hear the reading about transition and over, which is a positive one. You know, it's great, we've finished our mission, it's complicated, whatever. And on the same time, the reading of uh, humanitarian or Afghan being caught in this situation, which truly is more difficult for the people, right? Very clear. Our assessment is very clear. We base that on access to medical facilities, for example. It's more difficult today for an ordinary woman to bring a child, for example, or a family to find a place. Uh, uh, it's much more difficult today than it was two years ago, and it will be more difficult in a year ago, no problem. It's true, there are some places in the society where the quality of life is better, but it's only little places, right? Overall, overall the situation is and will remain extremely difficult uh, in that end. To give you another example, detention is something we are of course, careful. One thing we do ICSC is to follow specifically some really groups of high vulnerability. One are the detainees. We always forget that prisoners are, are, especially in that type of situation, extremely vulnerable. We have 18,000 prisoners now in uh, Afghanistan. I mean, the big issue in transition time, we have big issue. I mean, you have still several thousand of them in the hands of international forces. They will be transferred, some of them are already transferred under the hands of the Afghan authorities. And here, without saying wrong or right, the question is, do they have the mean to really do their job as they should? It's not easy, I mean, in terms of facilities, but in terms of, sort of treatment. Do they have the mean to redo justice? I mean, we need to make sure that the judicial guarantee, the transfer, the justice is done. Just to mention, that's the kind of questions. And here, the issue for us is, and maybe that's the last one, is about commitment. And it, it, maybe that's the, 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 the great questions, is we make sure, because I think that's what we hear. If you discuss with Afghan today, from wherever they are, I think their concern is clearly that in 2014, even before, but in 2014 latest, I mean, the entire international community will withdraw, tired, tired by Afghanistan, by the war. Don't want to hear anymore, you know? Really, sorry, we got it, you know? No, that thing, thank you. And then, it's not only about the military, but also about commitment, uh, the possibility to support these people. And I think there is a real, real, real uh, worry about the ability to, to move forward and, 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 and to commit ourselves. Uh, and I think that's something very important. It would be important for our organization. I mean, there's a very strong commitment. It is the first and the biggest operation for the ICSC. But ICSC, we have to be very humble. We are small to respond to all the problems of Afghanistan. I mean, the Afghans need to find solutions themselves, but, but they are not in a position right now, we think, to be able to do so. And I think we will be, they will be confronted with a, with a hell of a problem in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eve, for uh, what I've certainly uh, found to be a fascinating insight into, into the world ahead, a rather sober and um, certainly humanitarian challenges, the work of the ICRC, uh, you're not going to be taking too many flags off, unfortunately.
unfortunately, for the right reasons. Uh, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, one, one important uh, things that the ICRC does is, is communicate and disseminate, and uh, the National uh, Review of the Red Cross is the prime vehicle for this, and uh, I can ask to speak to that. Well, thank, thank you, Rick. I'll, I'll only be a short... Uh, rose between two thorns, as they say, but um, because we do want to hear from the incredible knowledge and erudite nature of Bill Maley. But I did want to just spend just literally a couple of minutes talking about the International Review. But before I started, I, I like a bit of poetry myself, and I was reading the other day T.S. Eliot, who's a wonderful erudite poet, and he wrote a question, posed a question to us, which is, what is the knowledge we have lost in information, and what is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And I think in a time of masses of information, through Twitter, which I don't quite understand, but it's apparently the next big thing, through sound bites, through e uh, Facebook, email, Wikipedia, we are flooded with information daily. But what I think we need is a little bit of time to reflect and develop and create perhaps pockets of wisdom. And what I would hope, and, and one of the reasons why I'm very excited about being involved in the International Review, is I think it is a place where, let's not be too hubris, it's not going to be all pearls of wisdom, but where it can have a chance to engage in the topics in a way that is um, moving towards that great quest of some wisdom. Um, the articles are longer. I mean, I actually I love the fact that it's been around, I think it was created in um, 1869. And I must admit, I'm a bit of a, a, a great reader of the review. And if ever I'm having a day that I'm wondering that it's all overwhelming and the world's too much, pick up an edition, and we've got many of them near my office. And it's so comforting to see that we, in many ways, things are changing, things are rapid. But many of the fundamental, um, I suppose, intrinsic human questions we're asking today have been asked for many, many years. And you'll pick up an article and you'll read it. And often I do a thing where I don't try not to see what the date is. And, I mean, whilst there's different technologies and there's different issues, no doubt, I think the challenge of trying to humanise the most inhuman action human can undertake, humanity can undertake, which is armed conflict, has always fundamentally had some issues. So I think the review both is, um, is comforting, but should be, and I've certainly found this edition that we want to launch tonight very challenging and scarily challenging, as any good piece of writing should be. It starts with a piece that I, I'm not going to go through each of the articles because you'll all read them or if you haven't you will. But what I loved is it starts with human agency. It starts with the story of a woman, uh, Dr. Samir, uh, Sima Samir, and really compellingly lays out the, I would say, the meta issues through one woman's experience. And I think it's very brave and very important for academic journals to take into account the individual, as I said, the human agency of these issues, or we get dislocated. And then at the very end, it finishes on a very reflective piece by Dr Fiona Terry, which should keep you awake at night, those of us in the humanitarian section. I just wanted to, to, uh, to quote a section, because what Fiona finishes, in a way, goes back to the start of what Samir starts in the, to the two, um, two versions. She asks a question that I think sh we should all ask when we work in this area. Today, if you ask, the Afghan population at large would have difficulty in articulating what humanitarian action is about. What would a woman, as Eve said, going to take her children to a hospital, think about these wonderful things that we all do every day and sometimes love to pat ourselves on the back about, which we need to, to keep our courage, our resilience and our tenacity. But if you asked a, a member of the population, what would they think? And Fiona writes, many would say it's a tool to help win the war. Others would say it's a vector through which to establish a new model of society compatible with Western values. Most would denounce it as a cover for spending millions of dollars to buy loyalty from former warlords. Some, hopefully, would still say that it's about helping those who are hurt by war. And they're the sort of questions I think we have to ask, rather than perhaps feeling very comfortable, as we should, though, on the amount of money spent. Um, being a part of the editorial uh, board of the International Review is a great honour and um, in some ways I represent this part of the world. So the other thing I wanted to plead tonight is please get in touch with me and if you've got a burning question that you want to spend time writing about, please either suggest topics that you'd like to include or um, 
think about engaging in it. The articles are longer. We're going to hear from the beautiful piece, I think very eloquent piece of Bill Maley, who over many years absorbs this history and can provide it to us in a way that's quite exciting. But I think in this part of the world we do have some good discussions. We do have some really interesting things to contribute to the International Review. I wanted to quickly flag the upcoming um, topics so you can start thinking, start writing. Over the holidays, why eat Christmas dinner when you can write an article on IHL, I say. Um, in June, well, the next version is on armed groups. A very interesting topic, understanding armed groups and the law applicable. Not writing about, but trying to understand. We then have engaging with armed groups. The future of humanitarian action, occupation, new technologies of warfare that, uh, that Eve articulated about uh, previously as a, as a big issue. Healthcare in danger, business and conflict, a really important topic. We <coughs> spend a lot of time talking about state actors, non-state actors in the sense of perhaps those irregular arms bearers. But what is the business community, which has always been on the cutting edge of, of um, exploration, what has the business community and conflicts got to do with each other? And then in 2013, it'll look at the ICRC in international relations. So we've got some really juicy topics. We've got an opportunity to contribute. Um, hopefully you will enjoy as well as be challenged reading, particularly the one we're um, launching tonight, which is on Afghanistan. And I won't take up any of your more time with my marketing, so you can actually get to the substance. So thank you. And uh, you, you can see why uh, Helen's been selected to represent us uh, on, on the board. Uh, and uh, her writing is, is equally as, as elegant. And, uh, and that message about, about wisdom. Uh, and Helen and I were sitting at the back of the room at the National Conference uh, uh, listening to the New Age uh, social media and, uh, and uh, the benefits. And there are lots of them, but uh, we're a little bit old fashioned. And uh, certainly if we can get to that wisdom, through to written word and uh, the review's been doing that for many years and I certainly enjoyed reading the articles uh, and, and none more so than uh, Professor Maley's who in a very short, concise and uh, being a lawyer, I'm continuously telling my lawyers, get that message across, make it simple, get your people into the story and he certainly did that in, in a very few short pages really spanned a, a vast array of very complex issues to do with the history and, uh, and, and the political makeup uh, that, that is now the Afghanistan that, that we're engaged in. So uh, if I could ask Professor Maley to have share some of uh, those uh, thoughts with you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, could I begin by saying it's a, a great pleasure for us at the Asia-Pacific College of Diplomacy here at the ANU to be able to co-host this event. We have a long and warm working relationship with both the uh, Australian Red Cross, which I've been a member for more than 40 years now, and also with the International Committee. Uh, and my own involvement with the International Committee uh, goes back to when I first went to Afghanistan and was able to recognise almost instantly that it was an actor like no other on the scenery there, uh, distinguished both by the length of its presence on the ground, but also by the depth of understanding of the complexities of the situation in Afghanistan, uh, which um, its staff uh, manifested almost on a daily basis, and in cooperation with their colleagues from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Um, I'm also glad that uh, Helen mentioned uh, uh, the particular contribution to these uh, special issues of the International Review by Dr Fiona Terry. This is a very personal matter. I was one of her PhD supervisors uh, when she wrote the thesis on which her brilliant and widely discussed book, Condemned to Repeat the Paradox of Humanitarian Action, was based. Uh, and that uh, uh, book went on not only to be widely reviewed in journals of the highest quality, but also to be awarded the Gravemeyer Prize for the best book of the year on international relations in 2002. Uh, and as with all her writings, her article in the special issue of the review repays very close attention, informed as it is not only by academic expertise, but also by the extensive fieldwork uh, in which uh, she has engaged for many years. And I actually remember sitting 
in the garden of the UN guest house in Kabul during the Taliban period, giving her detailed comments on one of the chapters which she'd managed to finish and get to me, uh, and which I was then under extreme pressure to return to her expeditiously, uh, as a supervisor should. What I want to do in my brief remarks is uh, make four points about the situation in Afghanistan, and I'm happy to expand uh, on these in the question period. The first point I want to make is that the situation in Afghanistan is, and for a long time has been, extremely complex. Structurally, Afghanistan is a, uh, a complex environment in which there is a multiplicity of different ethnic identifications to be found, in which different languages are spoken, in which different uh, sectarian affiliations are found, as we tragically witnessed on uh, Tuesday this week with the gruesome attack on Shia in Kabul just near the ISAF headquarters. And it's also geographically complex with the lives of people in rural areas differing in significant ways from those of um, uh, urban dwellers in towns and the relatively small number of cities. Uh, it's also worth noting, however, that uh, these uh, elements of structure have been subject to significant change in recent years because of the severe disruption which Afghanistan experienced following the communist coup of April 1978 and then the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979, which led to huge population displacement uh, and detached many people from mechanisms of traditional socialisation to which otherwise they would have been exposed. And one of the worst mistakes that uh, one can make when talking about Afghanistan is to see uh, groups purely in terms of tradition. Uh, without recognising that the mere fact that people may grow long beards and wear turbans doesn't necessarily mean that they are manifestations of a traditional society. In fact, one can argue that a group like the Taliban was far more a symptom of the dislocation of traditional society through decades of displacement into refugee camps than it was of any kind of traditional patterns of affiliation uh, and normative attachment within um, the rural areas where the bulk of the population lived. Uh, Afghanistan is also um, complex in political terms. Since 2001, there has been uh, a transition process which was shaped by the Bonn Agreement of December uh, 2001, which, the 10th anniversary of which has just been marked by uh, a major diplomatic conference that was held last Monday in Bonn. Uh, nonetheless, that proved not to offer a magic solution to Afghanistan's problems. The institutions which were devised as part of that process have in some respects proved dysfunctional and certainly rather weak. Uh, a significant element of elite disharm dis disharmony and disunity persists within the country. Uh, and in many areas, uh, the hopes of uh, ordinary people that they would be offered uh, clean government and a law-governed society have been disappointed. Instead, poor governance and a near total absence of the rule of law uh, have uh, proved to be the order of the day. And indeed, a fine book was published by Cambridge University Press last year, the same publisher that produces the International Review, entitled The Rule of Law in Afghanistan, Missing in Inaction. Uh, and that sadly captures what is the daily reality for ordinary people who find that rather than law being a check on the power of the powerful, instead it's twisted and manipulated to be yet another instrument in the hands of powerful people who can use it to achieve their objectives at the expense of the vulnerable. Uh, it's also the case that socially Afghanistan has experienced decades of disruption uh, and uh, this displacement of the population both in the refugee experience and through uh, internal displacement has been one of the factors compounding the level of trauma which years of war produced within Afghanistan. Uh, one point I sometimes make to colleagues from the military who are going to Afghanistan is that the mere fact that people may smile at them doesn't necessarily mean that they're not carrying with them an enormous amount of trauma. There are walking wounded on a, a, a grand scale to be found uh, in Afghanistan. And to give you a statistic which captures it, according to the best demographic study of population loss in Afghanistan during the 1980s, done by a demographer at this university, on average, between 1978 and 1987, over 240 people were killed every day for 10 years straight. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, for all the talk about civilian casualties in Afghanistan at the moment, the daily rate at present is running at about 3% of what was the uh, average daily rate during the 1980s, although that, of 
of course, does not mean that civilian casualties now are not a very serious problem, not only for the families that lose family members, but also in political terms. It's purely a, uh, a point about the scale of trauma to which people were exposed, many of them in their formative years uh, during the 1980s. When one puts these kind of factors together, one uh, is fairly obviously witnessing a combustible environment, but that is then complicated by the uh, strategic and geopolitical context as well. Uh, Afghanistan has for decades now been a theatre in which there has been really intense geopolitical competition for influence or even uh, uh, near control amongst various states of the neighbourhood and beyond. And this, of course, takes shape in the context of the toxic relations that have long existed between India and Pakistan following the partition of the subcontinent in 1947, the ongoing stress over Kashmir, uh, the uh, loss of East Pakistan in the, the Bangladesh War in 1971, uh, all of which have compounded to create a situation in which in Pakistan there's great fear that in the event of a renewed conflict with India, a pro-Indian Afghanistan could uh, tip the balance decisively in favour of India in the event of, of, of war occurring, uh, which in turn has created an incentive for some circles in Pakistan at least to support various surrogates uh, within Afghanistan uh, in various kind of ways. Uh, and to that extent, Afghanistan at different stages in its recent history has been exposed to what one might almost call a creeping invasion, uh, and dealing with that has proved to be a very difficult challenge politically and diplomatically for international actors. Uh, and to give you a sense of some of the evidence that um, supports this, um, in, the, in my paper in the review I quote um, uh, an observation that was made in 2007 by uh, former President Musharraf of uh, Pakistan during uh, a visit to Kabul uh, in which he said, there is no doubt Afghan militants are supported from Pakistani soil. The problem that you have in your region is because support is provided from our side. And I think that's a very insightful and credible observation from somebody in Musharraf's position. Uh, and of course it highlights one of the dilemmas of the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, sovereignty is a, a legitimate claim of states, but sovereignty imports duties as well as rights. And one of the duties of sovereignty is to prevent one's territory from being used for attacks on the territory of friendly neighbours, no matter by whom those attacks may be launched. Um, and uh, uh, in, uh, to give you one further piece of information which underpins this, in uh, 2010, the last year for which we have full year figures, uh, the total number of improvised explosive devices used in Afghanistan was 14,468. Now when that is the case, we are not talking about unhappy farmers concerned with poor governance at the local level. We're talking about industrial scale activities to produce uh, uh, explosives of this sort that um, require the, the backing of uh, fairly elaborate bureaucratic and organisational structures. So put all these together and you can see why the situation is difficult. It's also a dynamic situation and even his remarks uh, touch very much on this, that uh, the commitment of international actors to a winding down uh, in Afghanistan by 2014 has created an enormous amount of apprehension within elements of the Afghan population. But above and beyond that, it's also triggered a process in which all sorts of people are positioning themselves to be optimally placed at the point when international protection substantially disappears. Uh, and this uh, is not only something which has happened up to this point in various respects, but it is something which has the potential to produce sudden and catastrophic shifts in political alignment in the next couple of years. Um, it does not pay to be seen to have been on the wrong side in Afghanistan. And if the perception takes widespread root uh, that the Taliban are going to come back, then we shouldn't count on being able to manage a gentle extrication of international forces from Afghanistan, or for that matter aid workers, because the danger is that uh, all sorts of groups, in order to ensure their position in the aftermath of the Taliban coming back, will try to shift their attachments preemptively in order to win a certain amount of kudos from doing so. And that will create potentially an environment of shifting sands, 
within which a lot of the assumptions about how things will be managed in the next two years may be thwarted uh, by the unexpected. It's also the case, and again the Tuesday attacks uh, highlight this, that we may witness the emergence of new political forces. Um, it's simply not the case, as some have suggested, that Shiite Muslims and ethnic Hazaras have been free of danger in recent times. There were 10 decapitated in Uruzgon, uh, the province in which Australian forces are deployed just last June. But uh, mass bombings of Shia in urban areas have been uh, rare up to this point, and one knows, needs to go back to the massacre of 2,000 Hazaras in three days by the Taliban in Mazari Sharif in August 1998 uh, to come to something of equivalent uh, grisliness. Uh, nonetheless, what's striking about this event is that uh, the responsibility uh, was initially claimed by a, a, a radical Sunni group called Lashki Jangvi, which has been active in Pakistan since the 1990s. And more recently, a caller to the BBC has claimed responsibility for the attack on uh, behalf of what um, he said was an Afghan uh, offshoot of uh, Lashka i Jangvi. Uh, draw, uh, drawing on uh, uh, people from Wadak province um, who have allegedly committed themselves to a continuation of these kind of attacks. And uh, should that occur, the situation for uh, Shiites in Afghanistan could prove very dangerous indeed. There are, of course, positive signs as well as negative signs when one looks at dynamic factors in Afghanistan. And one of the positive developments there, which strikes virtually everybody who engages with the country, is that the young people of Afghanistan are some of the brightest and most impressive young people that one would meet in any country in the world. Uh, sadly, however, many of them are suffering under the weight of a dead hand of the past, because when the bureaucratic structure of the new Afghan state was fixed, by the allocation of departments to different political factions at the Bonn Conference in 2001. This set the scene for ministers and senior officials to be appointed not on the basis of expertise, but rather on the basis of their political connections to the factions to whom different ministries had been allocated. Uh, and that has created a sad situation in which there are brilliant young people in many of the ministries, but very often uh, their superiors would rather see their initiatives fail than see them flourish with a young person gaining the credit. And finding mechanisms by which the talents of these people can be nurtured is a real challenge. It's actually a challenge in which agencies such, such as the International Committee have played an important role because, again, if one looks at the local staff of bodies such as the ICRC uh, in Afghanistan, one can't but be struck by not only their dedication but also the dynamism that they themselves can bring. Uh, and I think it's actually very important to reflect on the way in which what are often seen as international operations within Afghanistan are actually partnerships in which some of the skills, expertise and structural advantages which international actors can bring are crucially augmented and uh, accentuated by uh, the genius of the fine people at the local level who work for them. Perhaps I've already made the third point that I want to emphasize now, but that is that the situation in Afghanistan is extremely dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous because, it's dangerous first and all for Afghans. If the situation really turns to custard in Afghanistan, it is the people of Afghanistan who will suffer more than anyone else. Uh, the interview with Dr. Seema Samar at the beginning of the, uh, of the first of the two special issues brings this out very clearly. Um, it's, uh, and I think there's a great apprehension on the part of women in Afghanistan at the moment that the fragile gains of the last decade could easily be traded away diplomatically for the sake of the will of a wisp accommodation with the Taliban that would probably deliver nothing diplomatically but which could compromise the commitment to core values uh, which have uh, um, so far been trumpeted by international actors as central to the legitimacy of the process of transition. Um, the situation, however, is also exceedingly dangerous for the region. Uh, and although regional stability in South Asia is not typically the kind of argument that will be produced by political leaders in Europe or America or Australia to justify a continued presence in um, Afghanistan, uh, in, if one puts aside the particular needs of Afghan, Afghans themselves, this is probably the strongest single region, reason for remaining engaged. If, at the end of the day, 
the perception is that the international uh, commitment to Afghanistan has unraveled and that the international operation there has failed. There is a very real risk that this will provide a dramatic stimulus to radical groups in the region, not Al-Qaeda, although Al-Qaeda continues to be more actively involved in Afghanistan than some reporting would suggest, but rather groups like Lashki Toiba, uh, which could easily be stimulated to attempt in India another large-scale terrorist attack of the sort that we saw in November 2008. And if that were to occur, occur, it's not clear to me that there's a force on earth that could stop the Indians from responding, and uh, I certainly don't want to be around if that happens. Uh, it's also a dangerous environment uh, for um, Australia, with troops on the ground who would need to be extricated. And of course, although I don't see this as a danger as such, uh, a collapse in Afghanistan is likely to lead to significant uh, additional outflows in the direction of Australia of um, refugees whose claims to be uh, refugees under the 1951 convention would be almost indisputable under the circumstances. And given that Australia is typically the first country to the east which they encounter, which is actually a party to um, the refugee convention, the notion that frippery such as the Malaysian solution would be able to deter people from coming in Australia's direction under those circumstances would be wishful thinking of the dreamiest possible variety. <laughs> so this kind of challenge could arise as well. That brings me to my final point. Given all these complexities, given these dynamic tendencies, and given the dangers in Afghanistan, there is no substitute for high quality analysis of exactly what's going on. And this is where the special issues of the International Review have something very special to offer. Uh, there is internationally a great deal of expertise on Afghanistan, and the editorial board and the, the editors have done a wonderful job of mustering that expertise and bringing it together in a way that anyone can read with profit and with the, the, the hope of illumination. Uh, the first um, uh, edition deals with a range of issues which could be seen as the broad political and social context of challenges in Afghanistan dealing with, with uh, the history and the geopolitics, the interaction between religion and armed conflict, transnational networks, the problems of impunity and insurgency, um, state building, and the responsibilities of Afghans themselves in the uh, rebuilding of their country, as well as issues relating to the rule of law. The second um, special issue then takes up very important issues relating to law uh, and drawing on the long engagement of the ICRC uh, as the custodian of the principles of international humanitarian law and as uh, uh, an organisation which has long had um, a brilliant role to play, which it again has executed superbly, in trying to familiarise people in Afghanistan with not only the importance but also the detail of international humanitarian law. And almost the first uh, ICRC staffer I met when, many, many years ago in Afghanistan when I was looking at these issues uh, was a remarkable man called Jean-Pascal Mauve, who um, would spend half his year as a taxi driver in Geneva and half his year working as a delegate for the ICRC d d disseminating international humanitarian law uh, in unlikely environments for taxi drivers. Um, and I thought this was actually a wonderful demonstration of a point which is, actually, which is often overlooked, but which in a way is central to the identity of the Red Cross. The Red Cross as a movement has flourished because of the role that ordinary people have played. Um, it's, it's a remarkable mixture of the high-level engagement of the International Committee and the Federation and a multiplicity of national societies in many different parts of the world that have uh, propagated an understanding of the core principles of the Red Cross and of the history of its contribution to uh, attempts in a modest but nonetheless significant way to produce some degree of uh, civilization in uh, circumstances of war which uh, until Jean-Henri Dunant witnessed the carnage of Solferino in 1859 had often been unconstrained by norms of that sort. Um, it's, uh, it's happily the case that in Australia there is a very strong tradition within the national society of uh, articulation of uh, these kind of norms. I'm happy to discover this afternoon that a very old friend of Red Cross in Australia, Dr. Mike Kelly, 
uh, has in the cabinet reshuffle been appointed as parliamentary secretary for defence with specific responsibility for uh, oversight of the transition within Afghanistan to 2014 and we can be confident because of his long-term involvement that the concerns of Red Cross will be very much built into the management of processes of change there. But, um, but in conclusion, um, the expertise of the Red Cross mixed with the uh, uh, history of community involvement there has created the basis for an understanding of the complexities of Afghanistan that I think no other organisation has been either in a position to contribute or has proved able to contribute. And in that sense, the event that we have this evening uh, is a manifestation of an attribute of the role of Red Cross in bridging elite and mass concerns within a society uh, which we at the Australian National University are very proud to have been able to support. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor. As engaging as ever, and I recall when I was one of your students doing my Masters, uh, it was certainly one of the lessons I look forward to, to spend some time uh, with Bill and, and discuss the sorts of issues uh, that, that, that he raised uh, today. Uh, I'm, I'm glad there was a, a hint of optimism there with, with the youth, and I would add uh, in the in the review some of the uh, articles by the women were also very inspiring in their stories and their endurance and their ability to to continue and and build a better future for themselves. So I think I think there is hope, and and we're certainly there uh, as uh, uh, Australians uh, assisting with that. We've got some time for some questions or some comments. Uh, perhaps I'll moderate from here and, and, uh, and uh, direct the questions to, to our panellists. Um, who would like to start? Jeff. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Eve a question. Uh, Eve, I've now had the pleasure of hearing you speak three times uh, during the, uh, the, uh, the short few days that you've been uh, here in, uh, in Australia and I, I commend you on your, on your energy. I I have to say. <laughs> one, of the, one of the themes that, you've, uh, that uh, has been very evident and one that struck me in the various things that you've had to say is the, the, uh, the likelihood in the, uh, I, I guess it would be more accurate to say, the certainty of continuing uh, change into the near term future. And I, I, I wondered what you had to say about the continuing adequacy and applicability and relevance of international humanitarian law to this changing uh, environment. You've said a lot about the changing, uh, the likely changing nature in armed conflicts and uh, the likely change in the actors that will be involved in armed conflicts. I'm thinking about comments such as the one famously made by former US Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, who once described the Geneva Conventions as quaint. And uh, on the assumption that uh, that's a view that you certainly do not share, I wonder, I wonder what uh, you could say to the audience uh, by way of uh, by way of suggestions as to uh, how those uh, those views might be uh, might be rebutted uh, in the uh, in the highly dynamic environment about which you've spoken since you've been here in Australia. Thank you. Um, as we all say in this case, it's a very good question. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, uh, and a very serious one. And I would be happy to have also Ellen maybe joining in the, in the response. I think the first element is. Is I think we should be careful about when we talk about change. It's true it's a rapid evolving situation, but I think some of the questions we are we are tackling in terms of international and, and law remain the same. Right? So the first element, we are strongly convinced that uh, whatever we talk about it, we think that the Geneva Convention therefore are extremely relevant to our conflict, absolutely, fundamentally. And I think we still feel that the, the first issue is about implementing, implementing law, very convinced. And that's one of the reasons I was so pleased to see the work done in Australia, in your country, in this country, very strategic for us. And we do believe very importantly that we need to have international law being integrated really at all the level, right? Very, 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 very critical for us. And I think the implementation of international law remains for us really the center of, of what we need to do and being sure that all people agree. That's one, that's well said. And I think to be clear, we, maybe this, the second element is uh, uh, we feel uh, we need to be careful to uh, not, when we talk about change, um, be too much on a defensive nature. And I mean, maybe it's a time now where we can maybe also reflect more about the evolving nature of warfare, but also of, of some of the big, big questions uh, we raise. So let me maybe say two or three things. One is, we at the ICSC over the last four years, 
we looked at humanitarian problems from the ground, as always as we do, and we looked at some of the response that the law can give, and was there problems in terms of law, or were there problems with implementation. We selected four problems where we thought out of 36, where we thought that, in fact, truly, law, international law, could be or improved, or there could be some clarity. The four issues were internally displacement, protection of the environment, detention, and mechanism of, uh, of uh, implementation of law and improvement. Right? That we will be looking to that. At an international conference, we, we, looked at, we discussed that with country. States are important for that. And in fact, we have agreed to work on mainly two areas. One is detentions. Uh, we think absolutely that in terms of judicial guarantee, transfer, there is a work to be done. And certainly, there is a way to improve possibly the treaty law in that aspect. The same on mechanism of, of implementation. I think there is clearly a place where we think there is a way, and I think there is a way also where we need to mobilize uh, the international community in moving in that direction to so truly, truly work on that. But that's only one element. I think the other element for us is all customary law. I'm still, a, I think all the study done on customary law is a very, very important element. And I think we don't even, uh, we can have a discussion on customary law. Some states, as you know, some people have a different opinion about that. But we are absolutely of the conviction that customary law are central to the improvement and to the interpretation of international law. So we need to look. We don't see law as something just put in the shell. We see that also developing and, 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 and moving in the right direction and understanding the interpretation. Last but not least, there are then questions, and, and they are difficult to know. I think they are a question of clarification. I think you know that it will create quite a lot of tensions, the clarification about direct participation of hostilities. I think it's important for us as an organization that we reach out to experts, we try to agree, maybe not always perfectly, but trying to understand what we need. We're trying to be practical, to see how it works. I think we're working also on the notion of occupation. What does that mean? Recognizing that interpretation of, of some of the notions into the internal armed conflict, for example, are difficult. I think that's very clear. And last but not least, all the question of cyber war is something very complex. We are watching that very carefully so far. Uh, we need also, we ICRC, to understand better exactly what it is at, at, at stake. But we need also to make sure that we are able to engage also state in that, that, that type of questions in order to really improve, if possible, the law. So roughly speaking, really two elements. One, the first one, making sure that we don't always forget that the first foremost is about implementation which means implementation is not about only states, but engaging audiences and groups like, we mentioned Afghanistan, the Taliban. We need to find ways to engage them also in that type of discussion, right? Very important. And B, being able to really follow the development, the possible development around that. And I think what is interesting, we got an interesting resolution from the international conference, which normally paved the way with the plan of actions. We know it takes time, but I think we, we are in a, we think we are options to uh, to make the necessary. I don't know if there you want to add. Just very briefly, and because uh, thank you, it's an excellent question, Jeff. Yeah, it's one that you know all of us in the media, particularly talking about IGL, is the first thing that's raised by people. It's, it's irrelevant. It's quaint. I mean, as as a lawyer for a moment, let me let me be a little bit boring. If you dig into the where that quote came from and others that Jeffrey Robinson made, it was actually in relation to the quaintness that the Geneva Conventions, the Third Geneva Convention, requires prisoners of war to be given musical instruments. Well, actually, the article doesn't require that. The article requires, and I won't bore you, but I think it's really important if we're going to make broad statements like Rumsfeld did, let's see what he actually was saying. The article allows prisoners of war to get care packages that can include, amongst other things, musical instruments. Because I'd be really interested to know what is quaint about distinction, what is quaint about proportionality, and what is quaint about um, unnecessary suffering. I mean, I think at the fundamental essence, um, the quaintness is is not about the fundamental principles of law, not the Red Cross or present ones. Um, and I think the devil is in the detail always. And I think the ICRC and certainly Australian Red Cross and any organisation looking at the laws of war, it is about clarification, it's about scanning, where are the holes, where are things changing. But I would love to, I did ask, I've spent a lot of time asking them, uh, diplomats about, tell me the quaint bits. I'm really genuinely interested, the bits that are totally, irrelevantly outdated. and. I don't, I don't get a very good answer, but maybe that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been one of the unknown unknowns.
Jim up the back, Kelly. John McFarlane from SDSC. I think could you explain the difference between the Red Cross and the Red Crescent? To what extent do they cooperate with each other? Are they the same organisations? Do they have identical philosophies? Just a little bit more about that. Certainly. What a delightful question. Thank you. I hope we get, don't get a chance to do pure dissemination. <laughs> and Eve would probably be able to do this better. But very, very briefly, I can, would you like to? Um, the Red Cross and Red Crescent are exactly the same. Um, I've had the privilege where, where Eve was too to attend the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Conference of the movement in Geneva last week. Uh, basically, to cut a long story short, a number of countries felt when they were looking at, in 1929, whether or not they used the Red Cross, that they had a history of people riding over the hills with a big Red Cross on their front, slaughtering the public, and thought, perhaps this history doesn't fit us so well. <laughs> so the inverse of the Swiss flag, which is the Red Cross emblem, um, it was agreed that the inverse of the Turkish flag could be used for those countries who didn't want to use the Red Cross. Um, and so across the world now, I don't know the numbers exactly, but we have 47, 47 Red Crescents. Now let's be really clear, it is not a Christian, religious, Islamic divide. Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, uses the Red Cross. Uh, yeah. Lebanon's a Red Cross. It, it is a much more nuanced dialogue. It's not a soundbite um, that you can put into a, a short radio interview that is often asked. Um, but basically, uh, our colleagues in the Red Cross and Red Crescent follow the fundamental principles, are part of the statutes of the movement, and in every way, stand shoulder to shoulder with everything we do, so our county red crescent. And in Australia, just to let you know, under the Geneva Conventions Act, um, I think section 15, uh, it's illegal to use the Red Cross or the Red Crescent or the Red Crystal without the Minister of Defence's um, permission. So under Australian law, domestic law, our act, it's this, uh, gives the same respect as the cross. You might could tell a story which brings that out. Uh, the, a Red, a Red National Red Cross Society has had responsibility at different stages for monitoring misuse of the uh, the emblem. Uh, and there was a medical practice at Sydney Airport which was using the Red Cross uh, to advertise its premises, which was a violation of the uh, uh, the, the act. And uh, they were sent a polite um, suggestion that they might um, move away from this use, and they totally ignored it. But then a group of uh, uh, dishevelled and extremely exhausted uh, refugees from Afghanistan arrived by plane at Sydney Airport <laughs> and were not met by the people whom they expected would be there. And so they went looking for succour and discovered that the one emblem that they recognised was the Red Cross. So they sat down in the waiting room of this medical practice and announced they were not going to leave. This was not actually the kind of customer that the practice was seeking to <laughs> attract, and they changed their emblem very quickly. <laughs> and I must admit at the time, because we write very nice letters and then refer them on to defence, but I suggested to the Secretary General that we could set up little refugee camps outside all the places where he's using the emblem, and he told me I was far too creative to go away. But um, I think it, it, I love that story because it yeah. demonstrates the real traction. So, yeah. yeah. And the refugees themselves knew the Red Cross emblem from and we're still waiting for the first Red Crystal Society to be formed. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I've already uh, indicated up the back with the laptops there. Uh, uh, you were the young person in Afghanistan, Gaza, Libya, Tunisia, and uh, Syria, and the situation in Australia is quite difficult to identify the effective government or governments with power and control over their country. How does the international community? Um, with organisations such as the Red, Red Cross go about deciding which government of the day to deal with? It's an open question. Um, it's a good question. I, I would say, I would hope it differently. For us, if I look at that, it's not at all the international community who needs to, to decide which government we are dealing with. It's our responsibility to deal in fact with government and all parties of the country or situation difficult. So, if, if I answer well your question, right? I think we are on a daily basis dealing with governments and with authorities around the world, right? And I think we're trying to do that in the situation of, of, of conflict. Now, if I understand well your question is, is that enough? Uh, is the international community doing, doing more? I think what we need to look at, and I hope that we look at, it's very clear that what the type of response we can provide is a response which is limited. We are limited, we are able to respond to the consequences of the situation, to the consequences of war and conflict, but we look at carefully, look at Afghanistan, if we talk Afghanistan for a minute. I mean, we won't be able to provide the solutions for the peace in Afghanistan, right? Or we won't be able to provide solutions for the stabilization of the country. 
And it's very important that we distinguish clear, clearly the limit of human aid. And I think that's one of the problems we've seen over time, is that under humanitarian objective, then you, you hide other objectives. I think we have specific humanitarian objectives. I think they are important, uh, but they are limited. And I think we need to make sure that if you look at the situation in Libya, in Syria, in Egypt, in Tunisia, if we want the international community to have a minimum of stabilization, that needs to have an economic, a political uh, effort, which is a, a conjunction of, a, of effort. Right? And I think that that would really clearly distinguish between what we can do, what we can provide, I think we can provide some new element, and what needs to be provided at the international community, community level. My concern is when I see the international community, I don't know what we call about, but let's say, when, when I say, for example, uh, some UN organization, or when I see country moving into a country, country, willing in a way to go for a, a humanitarian or a military objective and mixing the two objectives. I mean, that, that's a real concern it has, because it has an impact on the people on the ground, it has an impact on us too, and then we are unclear. But one of the problems, you will see, you will have an enormous discussion in this country, for example, about Afghanistan. What Was it worthwhile, yes or no, to go in Afghanistan? And it's a very difficult question. The problems you will have is you measure that against which objective? Was it an objective of, you know, security objective? Was it about Al Qaeda? Was it about stabilizing the country? Was it to helping humanitarian aid? And I think one of the problems I've seen for Afghanistan, and not, not only Afghanistan, it's the same for Libya right now, is a constant change of objective, which make it very difficult then to be able to have a real discussion. And that's I don't know if I respond to your question, but that's my real concern. We humanitarian, we're there to do a humanitarian work. It's an important one. We should also be held accountable. Are we good or not? And I can tell you, I'm extremely critical also about the level of engagement of humanitarian actors in Afghanistan, but other places also, really. I think mean, there is a lot to say about Afghanistan, really about the commitment and the ability of humanitarian actors to do a good job. But I think we should also be careful about what were the objective of the international community in Afghanistan and other places. And I think that, that would be helpful if we are at the clarity of the objective. That would really help a lot, I think. I don't know if I answer your question, but that's. Yes, just two quick questions. On, on the point with whom one engages, um, in 1987, almost 25 years ago, the Australian government in its recognition policy moved away from recognising governments as well as states to a position in which it would recognise states only, and under that rubric would then deal with a range of different actors. And I think in practice, this is what a lot of humanitarian agencies find themselves doing as well, that depending upon their particular philosophy, um, they engage with those with whom it is necessary to engage in order to give effect to their principles and achieve the particular objectives which accompany uh, uh, a mission. And um, there's nothing unusual about that kind of approach. Just on the, the, the last point that, that Eve was making there, I didn't touch on this, but there is a very messy uh, in environment surrounding humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan. There are some established actors such as the ICRC and some other actors with long-term presence in Afghanistan that understand the situation very well, that are clear about what it is that they're attempting to do, which have their own sense of what are the red lines uh, for engagement. However, there has been an enormous amount of money coming into the country in the last decade or so, billions, um, which um, have had the, uh, and these sums have had the effect of attracting all sorts of new um, contributors to uh, the landscape. Uh, private commercial contractors with very different ethos from the long-standing agencies that had been involved on the ground. Uh, some of them then subcontract their activities to actors who are not reluctant to grease the palms of government officials in order to get the kind of approvals which are necessary to operate in a complex bureaucratic environment. Um, and this has contributed to a situation in which for ordinary uh, people looking upwards, the reputation of humanitarian assistance is not the same as it was 25 years ago. The new actors have come in and have uh, muddied the waters and some would say poisoned the well. Mm -hmm. Just one other thing in terms of engagement, sorry, just 30 seconds. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a tent event at the conference and the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Norway, you ask your story, made one interesting comment. He said, he called, in terms of dialogue engagement, this last 10 years a lost decade. Mm -hmm. And what was his point, and I think I totally agree with that, 
he would say, including state, you ICSC, you the Red Cross, you engage always all parties to a conflict with your very pragmatic approach and you are impartial and neutral. We stayed. We didn't do that based on ideology because we said this group is a terrorist group, so a terrorist group, we don't speak to a terrorist. We own those people that. And suddenly, 10 years later, what happened? We as state, we've not been able to engage in fact, the parties. And if we are serious about stabilization and our engagement, and I know it's complicated, I know they are, counter-terrorist law, whatever, but how do we do that? We've not engaged Hamas, we've not engaged Hezbollah, we've not engaged uh, uh, the Taliban, it was the Norwegian Minister of Affairs saying that, including Norway, right? including the important country. And, and how do we do that? Uh, uh, and suddenly we rediscover the Taliban, you know, when it is useful, but it's too late. You know? and, and I think it, it's a very interesting point and a, a good reflection, I think, which we should all go. I mean, humanitarian, we have a clear perspective, but I think government and state officials should also think about it. And I know it's a complex one, but I think we need to look into that. Can I just, sorry, quickly, because I'm <laughs> waiting for more questions. And that is a very, very complex discourse to have with the public. I mean, I get, at the end of the phone, that the public we got very, very angry because they've heard that the Red Cross is involved in training uh, first aid to uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, and to try and have an engagement, I think we've had a very polarised uh, discourse out there, and to try and have an engagement that this is actually something that is, is good to have that sort of uh, interface rather than something that as Red Cross, um, and people don't understand the ICRC versus National Society, a Red Cross is a Red Cross is a Red Cross. So I think that it's something we need to talk about more in civil society, about how within the parameters and understanding the, the framework of uh, anti-terrorist organisations and legislation, how do we ensure that we keep this dialogue open, which is, you know, read this stuff, the only, only way we're going to go forward. And perhaps our last question. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, my name is Bob Gaten, uh, PhD student at Patti here. I'm researching on Afghanistan. Uh, I have two questions, one from colleagues from ICRC. Uh, the question is that basically in the last 10 years, aid has been uh, militarized and politicized in Afghanistan, and has, this has created a, a lot of complex, complexities in the country among the public and also vis-a-vis -vis the insurgents. How do you see the challenge after like 2014, let's call it like transi transition, after transition process, so, and for the, the, the impact of such a legacy on your world? A second question is from Professor Mali, that how do you see the political arrangement in Afghanistan? Because by uh, the, while it is declining and military support is declining to Afghanistan, of course, more pressure should, should be put on political like enter approaches. Mm -hmm. So how do you see, it's not only to, to call like, to, to accelerate uh, uh, reconciliation process, but what about the whole political architecture in Afghanistan? To make it a long story very short, I, I think we, we, <coughs> we, we think the next two or three years, difficult to, to go further, will be more difficult. I think we have no doubt on that one, including for us, for ICSC, and for our, our colleagues of the Afghan Red Crescent. We think that, but to be honest, I don't think it's only because of the politicization of aid. I think there is an issue about that, without any doubt. We felt that already for a long time. I think it has just put us more under pressure to prove every day that we are serious about that. The good news is, I think Afghan people are well informed, in a way. Maybe not by radio, but I think they are also aware uh, on, on, on some of the things. So they're not talking, the community are aware what is happening really, what is not happening. I think so, right? But now, nevertheless, it's a daily challenge to be able to prove, and I think people, they, they really want you to prove that you're able to do that. So it's nice to say that you're neutral, impartial, and independent. I think it's a question about able to demonstrate that. The real questions I have is we could easily lose that ability if we are not able to be close to where it happens. And that's my concern. Because we, we, we can come, it happens to us from time to time, in a vicious circle, where for security reasons, we have to go back, I would say, to towns, urban area. We not, cannot reach any more the people. And then the same for the Afghan Red Crescent. And then we are in trouble. Because then people are not able to see us where they are. But I think the issue is, in Afghanistan, you cannot just wait for people to come to you. You have to go to there. It seems obvious. But I think it's a big issue. And here, that's my concern. My concern is in 12, 13, if we, if, and I hope we're wrong, but if the situation is more dangerous, if there are more tensions within Afghan, 
there's more uh, civil war type of thing, it might be difficult for the Afghan Red Crescent, it might be more difficult for us too, let's be honest. And then I would believe it very quickly that we lose our will of it. And that, that, that's a concern I have, at least in some part of the, uh, of the country. So that, that, that's what I would say if I look. Then beyond that, we'll have to look. I think the beyond that part will be important is the commitment. I think what people recognize in Afghanistan is the fact that the Red Cross has been committed for, for the enormous time. And I think then, if you look at the level of suffering also, I don't know, if I just look at figures, I think you know that we just mentioned, we did a study in 2009, just to have a sense, 70% uh, of Afghan reported to have lost a property, right? Destroyed or lost. 20% uh, of people have been detained, right? 33% uh, of people injured. So it gives you just a sense of this population has gone through now decades of war, and they are all affected. It means, on the other hand, they all, in a way or another, felt our presence and be able to judge that. But it's true, the judgment can change tomorrow. That's very true. Yeah. Thank you. And the second question? Yeah. Um, I've endorsed what you've just said. The sad thing about Afghanistan is that there's a population, probably between 20 and 25 million, although no one knows for certain, probably no more than 150,000 have caused all the trouble for everyone else. The vast bulk of the population has simply been trying to survive in circumstances that are completely beyond their control politically. And, uh, and they deserve enormous sympathy with the kind of challenges that they've, they've faced. Uh, just imagine the sky falling in, that's the kind of thing that we think of. Oh, in terms of political institutions, I think a lot of people will look at the politics of Afghanistan and say this is a profoundly dysfunctional system. It's partly because the constitution which was put in place in 2004 has had unintended consequences. Uh, for example, it's, it's not typically a brilliant idea to have an attempt to build a strong presidential system in a country with a multiplicity of different ethnic groups. Because at the end of the day, the likelihood is that one group will see itself as the winner and many groups see, will see themselves as the losers, which is not the case in a parliamentary system where you can create the impression that each group has a certain place in the sun by virtue of uh, members in a meaningful parliamentary um, chamber. Um, Having said that, it is, however, very difficult to procure, procure reforms of constitutional systems, even if they're dysfunctional. Because almost by definition, the people on whom one relies to initiate reform are those who are the beneficiaries of the existing system, the people who have been elected to office of various types. And, and turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So uh, I'm not at all optimistic that we will see any of the kinds of reforms to the constitutional structure that are routinely discussed by uh, international experts ever progressing. And that then has real implications for 2014 because it's largely overlooked that 2014 is not just a terminus date for some forms of international involvement. It's also the scheduled date for the next presidential election. In and uh, elections are divisive activities. They create winners and losers. And losers typically don't like losing. <laughs> and, um, and that can set the scene for the kind of epic fraud that we saw at the 2009 election, which was probably not orchestrated by President Karzai, but almost certainly orchestrated by people in his circle who feared that if the incumbent were defeated, they too would fall a long way before they hit rock bottom. Uh, and if that were to be attempted again in 2014, which is a very real risk, um, if you get away with fraud on a couple of occasions, you, it becomes the norm uh, of political practice at a main league level. Then the potential for something like that to create an explosion <coughs> in an environment which will already be extremely fraught because of the winding down of international presence shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, not much keeps me awake at night, but uh, I have a feeling that as that election looms, I'm going to need my monitor. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, for those questions and, uh, and uh, for, for your patience, though. Uh, I'm sure it was no great ordeal that and the quality of the answers. Um, if I can just uh, conclude uh, the, um, the session now, uh, there's a couple of ads that are Red Cross, uh, publications up the back. Please feel free to help yourself. And there's also an opportunity to sign up uh, on uh, the uh, IHL e newsletter, and we urge you to do that and keep in touch. and. Uh, I think you'll find uh, some interesting information. 
I thank you first uh, to our host, uh, Professor Maley, and the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy here at the ANU. It's been a terrific venue. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, uh, our speakers, um, for, for their uh, outstanding contribution for, for tonight. And, uh, I found it fascinating, and, uh, and, and thank you all for, for coming tonight. Also for those who uh, helped us at the, um, the uh, venue up, uh, um, the uh, ACT, IHL uh, team, and the ICRC team, and of course facilitating you who's come uh, so, 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 uh, so far away. So if I can uh, first distribute the goodies now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.